So for our second talk, I'm very happy to uh, uh, have uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Smith as the speaker. Uh, she is a, a psychiatrist working in the Department of Psychiatry, University of Oxford, and the Oxford the Precision um, uh, Psychiatry Lab. Uh, the title of her work today is um, Digital Technologies and uh, uh, Telepsychiatry and uh, Evidence-Based uh, Synthesis of uh, Current Gadgets. Uh, uh, Catherine, do you want to take over the screen and I'll take, and start uh, your talk now? Yes, thank you. I'm hoping everyone can see my slides. Are you able to see those? Yes. Lovely. Okay. I'll just put those on full screen mode. So just let me know if anything goes wrong with the technology. So my name's Dr. Catherine Smith. I'm um, an honorary consultant psychiatrist. I work in Oxford at the University Department of Psychiatry. Uh, I have a background in clinical research and implementing high intensity clinical research studies uh, and I work some of the time at the NIHR Cognitive Health Clinical Research Facility. Um, but I, I'm going to talk today about some work that we've been doing out of the Oxford Precision Psychiatry Lab and it's very much motivated by the situation that we find ourselves in with COVID-19. So uh, we started at the beginning of lockdown to quite rapidly produce um, guidance, uh, a synthesis of guidance to answer urgent clinical questions that senior clinicians were asking us to source evidence for. And I'm working as part of a group and you can see there listed the other members of the group. And we also have a wider set of collaborators, both nationally and internationally, who've been helping us in disseminating the guidance and in some cases in translating it. So the background to COVID-19, I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with, um, but this is the background for which we developed this um, synthesis of evidence-based guidance. Um, so uh, as you're very well aware, it's extraordinary to think now that COVID-19 was only first described in December of last year and it's progressed incredibly rapidly. And because of that rapid progression and the global pandemic, we've had critical challenges in all areas of our lives, but particularly in the area of public health, in the area of clinical research, and also um, most importantly, really, provision of health care. Um, because the pandemic has rapidly evolved, there have been, certainly for clinicians, updates being produced on an incredibly rapid basis. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were getting daily updates, sometimes more than daily updates. And so for clinicians, this presented a real problem, which some of you will, I'm sure, be aware of. And that was a problem really of information overload. So trying to find really easily accessible, reliable, up-to-date answers to immediate clinical questions was really difficult and time-consuming. And we had an extra difficulty in mental health. In the, in the initial phases of COVID, certainly it's primarily a physical disease, as you know, and so most of the guidance that was coming out was focused on, on physical symptoms and management of physical symptoms. Uh, less on mental health and what there was on mental health was often hidden within bigger documents or in different specialties such as palliative care for example or respiratory medicine. And the other difficulty that we had with the different sources of information was that they were coming from, from lots of different sources. So we had information from our specialty organisations in mental health, we had countrywide guidance and also worldwide guidance, for example, from the WHO. And then we had a mixture of the sorts of information that was coming to us. So a lot in the beginning, a lot of personal experiences and commentaries on situations, particularly in countries that were ahead of us. Uh, more recently, some original research and then more formal guidance. So in response to that, we were contacted by senior clinicians in our trust, and it was a combination of disciplines, really, not just doctors, but also nurses, um, pharmacists and uh, managers who all wondered if we could help in um, providing answers to specific clinical questions that they had. And so over the time of lockdown, we have covered in our summary tables guidance on a variety of topics and it's been very much driven by those clinical questions. So you'll see a range of, of drugs listed there. These are really the medications that 
uh, require a lot of face-to-face -face contact um, in order to continue prescribing, and that's provided really um, particular challenges during COVID-19. But we also cover um, more general clinical areas, such as the management of patients on inpatient wards, um, particularly trying to reduce the risk of cross-infection whilst carrying on with uh, ward activities and some of the special physical complications that we may need to consider in the context of COVID, such as the question of vitamin D supplementation and uh, prophylaxis for um, venous thromboembolism. But today I'm going to focus specifically on digital technologies and telepsychiatry. I think that will be most of interest to you. But if you want to look at the, uh, our web page, we do have tables on other areas. So first of all, I was just going to um, cover a little bit about why we need guidance in telepsychiatry, um, which may not be apparent to all of you. Um, so clearly with um, the need for um, social distancing, face-to-face -face consultation during the current crisis is, is more problematic. And so we um, have been forced in a really rapid timescale to, as clinicians, to where we can to convert to more remote methods of consultation. And the NHS in the UK has been forced to implement that change in an incredibly rapid timescale and to make sure that there are at least adequate IT systems to support this. Um, and that sort of timescale, I think, would have seemed unimaginable a few months ago, but, but it's, it's certainly happened quickly. We also need know that in mental health, support is quite likely that the need for support is quite likely to increase over the coming months. And that's for a couple of possible reasons. Um, first of all, as we know, the impact of social isolation and quarantine um, has a greater impact on those who are more vulnerable, and that would include those with pre-existing mental health conditions. But there's also more recently some evidence to show that although COVID-19 is primarily a physical disorder, particularly those who have more severe infections and complications and perhaps end up on ICU, there is some evidence that like other coronaviruses, there are specific neuropsychiatric consequences in the long term of that severe illness. So for those two reasons, uh, there's a likelihood that we will need to increase our degree of support as we go forward. In terms of telepsychiatry, there is actually a strong evidence base, but it comes, I would say, mainly from the States and is not particularly well known outside America and not particularly well known in the UK. And certainly from clinicians, there are a lot of concerns about using telepsychiatry. I think uh, one of the key ones is that it's not as effective um, both for the clinician and the patient as in-person assessment and treatment but also some concerns around safeguarding, um, how to assess risk remotely, um, and information governance issues as well about privacy and security. And so for all of these reasons, and because again, focused around these very specific questions from um, senior members of our trust, we felt that clinicians, patients, and healthcare organizations wanted to have access to reliable and practical clinical guidance and evidence. So uh, in terms of generating this synthesis of evidence, we used an evidence-based approach quite similar to what you would use in a systematic review, and we use this for all our tables. So as I said, we focused um, at the very beginning on these very specific clinical questions and we designed the table to be a question and answer table with links to original sources after each of the answers. So for those people who wanted to go and look up more, there was a, an embedded hyperlink that you could click on and you could go to the original guidance source. We knew that we needed to develop each of these tables as quickly as we possibly could, could and some of them were, were developed within sort of four to five days. And so what we were keen to do was to have the data presented on an open access website that would be accessible by all, but also to make it really dynamic and interactive. So that means that users and readers can contact us with additional information, perhaps corrections, things we've missed out if that's happened, so that we're constantly updating and refreshing our web page to keep it um, up to date. 
So I'll show you the website in a minute, but we used the platform of the Oxford Health Biomedical Research Centre and Oxford PPL is one of the divisions of the uh, Oxford Health BRC. And we used our Twitter handle, which I've shown there in red, as the main route by which people could contact us and interact with us if they wanted to about the tables. So like a systematic review, we agreed the search strategy in advance. And because of reasons of speed, we decided to focus first on English language guidance, but not just covering the UK, obviously covering all English language um, uh, guidance that was available. So two or three researchers systematically searched the guidance using the search strategy. We then generated the guidance and um, areas of uncertainty were resolved by discussion with the other team members. Just like a systematic review, we recorded everything that we did in the methodology, um, including the sources that we searched and then those that we actually used. For some of the tables, particularly this one, we used an expert, we can't be expert in, in every area of psychiatry as a small team. And it was particularly key in such a broad area as this to have an expert not only to guide us in making sure that we were inclusive of all uh, relevant sources, but also that we balanced differences in guidance. And I'll talk about this in a minute, but there was certainly a difference in approach from the US and UK guidance, and we wanted to balance that and represent both sides um, in a representative way. And then we converted the output from the search of guidance into tables in three versions. So we have the interactive web page, which I'll show you in a moment with the embedded hyperlinks. So you can look at that online, search for your question, look at the answers. We also have a PDF version. So um, that's a version obviously you can download, print, have next to you when you're doing a remote consultation. And then finally, a word table which contains all the details um, that we used in generating the table for those who want that. So this is an example of the search strategy. Um, in the darker blue, you can see all the um, sources of guidance that we searched. And then in the lighter blue, the ones that we actually use that had relevant guidance within them that we used in the generation of the table. So I'm now going to hopefully take you onto the web page. Um, so these are the addresses of the website and I can, um, I'm happy to obviously to uh, circulate these after the talk so that you can go and have a look yourself. The, um, the first one here um, is the general website for, our, for the guidance covering all of the areas I've described. The second one is the table that specifically covers uh, remote consultations and uh, telepsychiatry. And finally, as I said, our, our Twitter handle for you to communicate with us if you want to. So I'm now just going to um, see if I can change my screen. Mm. There we go. So I'm hoping that you can see the web page now. Um, is everyone able to see that? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll assume you are. So um, this is the, the front face of the web page that I was talking about. Um, as I said, it's hosted on the Oxford Health BRC web page. Um, and within that, if you go into our work, you'll see the Oxford Precision Psychiatry Lab. And then on the side in the bar here, our um, COVID-19 guidance. So this is the front page of the whole guidance. And obviously you can have a more detailed look if you wish afterwards. So we have a bit of a description of the, the techniques that we use that I've gone through with you. A little video here that uh, just tells you a little bit about the guidance and some of the things I've been talking about. Um, as I said, we had huge interest really right from the beginning from um, international collaborators and we now have translations of some, not all of the guidance, into different non-English languages and they've also adapted their guidance for use in their particular country, particular country as well. So 
just a link there to those. And then at the right at the bottom of the guidance, we have all the particular tables. So I'm going to take you just onto the digital technologies and telepsychiatry page. They're all set up very similarly. So this is a good example. Um, so uh, first of all, I mentioned we used an expert um, for this table just to guide us and make sure that we were inclusive and balanced. For this table, it was uh, John Torres, who's based at Harvard, um, and he has a special interest, as some of you I'm sure will know, in technology and mental health. And he's been involved with the APA's working group on the evaluation of smartphone apps. He's also involved in, in some of their training programs to do with telepsychiatry. So he was very helpful indeed in thinking about how to present the guidance in a, um, a useful way for clinicians. And one of his first suggestions was because we have a lot of guidance was to um, make sure that we had the first table as a very short and um, brief guide for clinicians in doing telepsychiatry consultations. So that's table A. This really is very brief. It's designed for busy um, clinicians to have a checklist of things that they might want to consider when they're thinking about telepsychiatry. And we've referenced in here particular sections from our more detailed second table. And at the end of this um, brief table is a checklist of questions that clinicians might think of asking at the beginning of a consultation. And this comes from the APA toolkit on telepsychiatry. Um, and obviously it's referenced. And when I first looked at this as a clinician, I thought it looked really very basic and wondered how helpful it would be. But in fact, I've been using it in all my um, remote consultations. And I found it really helpful, actually, at the beginning of a consultation, just to, uh, it sounds obvious, but to ensure that I'm speaking to the right person, that they are expecting to speak to me. They know that we're talking about their mental health and also making contingency plans for if the technology fails, finding out whether anyone else is in the room with them, for example, and that sort of thing. So this is this is a really, I find, a very helpful checklist to use. Moving on to our second table. So this is what all of our tables look like. Um, we focus them around clinical questions. So in the blue bars, you will see these are questions that cl clinicians have asked us to answer, if you like, or to synthesize the guidance on. And we've clustered them together within a theme. So on the gold bar is, is a, a theme to tell you what the questions are about. And what we suggest is that I know people will dip in and out of the guidance, which is fine. Um, and obviously will be they will have limited time. But we suggest that if clinicians are dipping into the guidance, if they read the answer to one question within a group, that they read the rest of the group because they tend to be interlinked. So, for example, one of the questions clinicians often have asked is what the evidence base is. And so if you click on the question, you then find um, the answer to that question from the existing guidance. And at the bottom, we've included these embedded hyperlinks so that you can click on the link if you want to find out more detail than we've given here. Um, another common question is whether there are any settings where telepsychiatry might actually be better than in-person care. And again, we've given some examples here from the guidance. And at the bottom, just as I said before, we have the, the links to the guidance that we've used so that you can go to the original sources. So just moving through, um, we cover existing guidelines. Um, interesting here that, as I said, the UK and US guidelines do differ quite significantly. Um, the UK guidelines are very much pre-COVID and are quite cautious, understandably, about being very careful about the limits of telepsychiatry, whereas the American guidelines tend to be a bit more expansive, um, perhaps a bit more creative in what they talk about. And they also cover wider issues like the combination with other digital technologies. So we wanted to make sure that we represented both sides of that in our guidelines. So if you look under the guidelines, we have the UK side, which comes from quite a few different sources, the Royal College of Psychiatrists and their special interest group, the GMC, etc. 
and then further down we have the US guidance so that clinicians can look at both of those and compare them um, so that they're fully aware of what the guidance is. I mentioned in information governance issues as well and those are covered there. And then we go through the consultation with guidance on what you might do before you start the consultation, what you might do during and what you might do afterwards. And then some information on some subspecialties. There's a little information on children and adolescents and older adults, cultural issues, um, some guidance on multidisciplinary assessments as well. So that's our second table. And then right at the end, we have a third table which focuses specifically on child and adolescent psychiatry. Because as you're probably aware, we do a lot of family assessments and uh, there are some things to consider there in terms of how you arrange the room and how you arrange the consultation to involve everybody in that family assessment. So I'm very happy to answer questions about the guidance when we come back to it. Um, but what I'm going to do now is just go back to my slides if I can. And talk a little bit about where we go from the guidance really. So um, what we aim to do was really just to provide a synthesis of guidance um, in the field of telepsychiatry and the use of digital consultations in the context of COVID. Um, and I think one of the things that we as a group feel is that there's an opportunity here not just to see remote consultation as a, an acute solution to a, an acute situation, but also to think about implementing telepsychiatry as a longer term strategy. It's something that's been talked about uh, before COVID at length, but has never really been implemented, certainly in the UK and certainly not on a large scale. But now that we've had to implement it, I think um, we've rapidly learned a lot about it and it's a chance to think about using it more long term and using the benefits that we know uh, it can offer in certain situations. So to do that, of course, clinicians need to feel confident and competent in using telepsychiatry. And the first step really to feeling confident about it is to have access to a reliable source of guidance. And hopefully our synthesis of guidance will be helpful in that. I think longer term, we'll need to think a little bit more about training um, and uh, that will be um, important in the longer term implementation. And there are examples of really effective training schemes, particularly in the US, for example, with residents in psychiatry. Um, and that training includes not only remote consultation, but also training residents in combining that with other digital technologies like using mobile apps, for example. And I'll talk about that in just a, a minute or two. Of course, you know, as clinicians, we need to remember it's not just about us and uh, we also need to think about patients being able to access telepsychiatry as well. And there are quite a few reasons why patients won't be able, might not be able to do that. Um, there's obviously the issue of, of confidence and competence in using digital technologies and that's not universal. And of course, there are certain um, uh, parts of society who are more likely to feel underconfident or to feel they lack competence in that area. So there may be cultural issues, there may be um, issues to do with older, older adults, for example, that make that more difficult. There's also the practical issue that uh, many patients just don't have access to technology to do it. So if they don't have a smartphone, for example, or they don't have access to a mobile phone, then um, uh, remote um, telepsychiatry is going to be impossible for them. So I think more generally we need to think um, about access, equitable access for patients. And interestingly, in the American guidance, there is are some examples of uh, training for mental health um, clients, mental health patients, helping them to feel more confident and competent in, in accessing um, telepsychiatry. And the final element, of course, is that we need organisational change. We've already had this acute organisational change. It's been, been forced upon organisations. Um, and there have been examples, for example, in the States of, of organisational change to reduce um, barriers across states um, and federal barriers to allow telepsychiatry to be practised more in a more widespread way. 
But for organisations, I think, to implement longer term change, they are going to need research and evidence of cost effectiveness of beneficial outcomes and also um, evidence of the possibility of an enhanced level of care. So rather than looking at it just as a, a replacement for in-person care, looking at the possibilities for actually enhancing care. Certainly longer term, it offers options for both patients and clinicians to sort of think about personalising the type of care that they feel would be best for them. And it's likely, I think, that patients having experienced, at least some patients having experienced telepsychiatry or remote consultation will opt for this in the longer term, even if it's not strictly necessary um, under the rules of, of um, isolation related to COVID. Um, and there are a lot of advantages for the patient. There's obviously reduction in stigma. It's a much more private way of seeking help. You don't need to go to a mental health hospital or facility. And it's um, convenient and uses less time off work and those sorts of things, less travel for the patient. So it's likely that, that we may be looking towards a more sort of hybrid model of care where either in-person and telepsychiatry are combined or telepsychiatry and other digital technologies are combined. And so to do that as clinicians, we'll need to feel confident and competent in using each different set of media, but also in combining them as well. And that brings me on to thinking a little bit about telepsychiatry and the options for easily combining with other digital technologies. So um, you'll be very familiar with other technologies that are, are options here, but these could include platforms for monitoring symptoms. For example, in Oxford, we have the True Colours Mood Monitoring System, um, which some of you will be familiar with. And that's a mood um, monitoring system where by email or text um, patients are prompted to complete um, online um, uh, ratings of mood, including, for example, anxiety ratings, ratings of depressed mood or ratings of elated mood. And then you then get a longitudinal picture of how mood has changed over time. And that, of course, is hugely uh, valuable in terms of uh, research, but it's also valuable in the clinic in that the clinician and the patient can together look at that record and, and look at the effects of different interventions to see how helpful they've been. But the other option um, for combining with other um, digital technologies is combining with apps. And obviously those offer advantages of accessibility and also uh, an insight into physical and cognitive behaviour in real time. So that can be really effective in assessing how helpful health treatments have been. Of course, with apps and using apps within healthcare, we need to be careful about the effectiveness of the app, the safety and security, and clinicians and patients need to assess that together. But there are frameworks for doing that, such as the uh, American Psychiatric Association App Evaluation Framework. And because we know that apps are, are twice as effective when they're used in combination with a clinician, combining them with telepsychiatry does present some exciting opportunities. And also, particularly at the moment, while we're in quarantine and social isolation, lifestyle interventions are particularly interesting um, in terms of uh, improving mental health via mobile apps. So just at the end, of course, as with any piece of research, there are limitations and we should recognise those and try and confront them as much as we can. I've talked uh, right at the beginning of the talk about the fact that we can find our search to English language guidance only. Um, a lot of the guidance does rest within the English language, but of course not all. Um, and we try to modify this obviously by not restricting ourselves to the UK and covering all English language speaking countries. Um, and also we quite rapidly um, had international collaborators and translations, so that's helped enormously with that. For some of the tables, particularly telepsychiatry, as I said, the guidance varies between countries and you need to balance that to reflect this and represent all different guidance views. And so collaboration with an expert was really crucial there. And we we're also aware when we were synthesising the guidance that it was a mixture of the majority which was pre-COVID and then some which was COVID specific guidance, um, which we obviously flagged up when, when we presented that. But it does 
produce some inconsistencies in the guidance. It's quite hard to synthesize different views. And we also had some guidance from previous disasters, which is relevant. But as you can imagine, the current crisis is somewhat different to the global nature and, and the rapidity of um, transmission of the virus makes this a rather different um, uh, situation to previous ones. The majority of the guidance on telepsychiatry focuses on general adults, um, and there is some for younger and older populations. But um, for thinking about the general population in mental health, uh, there isn't specific guidance on other populations who may, might be more difficult to engage, for example, those with learning disabilities, um, patients who might have psychotic or paranoid symptoms, those with personality challenges or eating disorders. And there isn't any specific guidance on telepsychiatry in those populations. It would be helpful to have that going forward. The guidance doesn't differentiate clearly between initial assessment and follow up. And although in some ways there are, are many um, common themes between those two sorts of um, assessments, um, they do differ in focus and they differ very much in length as well. Um, and so it would be helpful to have guidance between those two types of consultation. And the guidance doesn't cover the sort of hybrid model of care that I was describing, which may well be the way forward, at least for some patients, of combining different ways of interacting with their clinician. So I'm going to stop there. Um, if anybody wanted to have more information on our tables in general or the guidance that we've produced, then uh, we um, have published an editorial in evidence-based mental health. So I've popped that there, um, which just gives a lot of what I've talked about in the talk, but some of the background to the guidance we've produced and um, also the strategies behind and how we generated the synthesis. So I will stop there now for questions. Catherine, thank you very much. If anybody wants to ask them, can I suggest they raise their hand and that way we'll sort it out. Catherine. While people are thinking of questions, I, I would like to ask you a, a general question, really. I mean, you've obviously got an enormous amount of experience of what works and what doesn't work now in this interactive new world we find ourselves. It, one thing that occurs to me, and I'm sure it occurs to lots of people, is that all of a sudden in these online interactions, there is a potential to collect a great deal of information about what goes on in an interaction between a patient and a, and a clinician that could well turn out to be really a useful research resource, but also, if not used wisely and carefully, potentially a massive invasion of privacy, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I just wonder whether you, you've reflected on what might be good practice and the right way to think about that sort of question. Gosh, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, you're right. It does offer um, it does offer the option for collecting data, um, but it is balancing privacy. And I think, uh, I mean, I think at the moment, remote consultations have been used very quickly, and clinicians are just doing the very best that they can um, in in using a medium that they're not very familiar with in general. I mean, some clinicians have used this, but but generally most of us are used, used to in-person consultations. Um, in terms of the, the sort of data that you could record in a research setting, um, there are lots of options. There are options in terms of um, clinician data and, and what how clinicians are um, using remote consultation and then there's patient data as well. But there, as you say, um, there are issues of privacy. I'm not sure whether I've answered your question or not. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure either. Um, <laughs> I was actually thinking about the actual interaction. OK. Um, for example, I mean, as, I, as you know, I'm interested in capturing and learning from how people emotions reflect their underlying condition. Um, here, in a sense, is a is a wonderful resource for how, for example, the clinician is responding to the emotions of the individual or 
there's a fair amount of stuff that could become abstracted and de-identified and well separated from individuals, um, which could be very, very informative as to how people structure their interactions and whether they are making things better and so on over time, I imagine. But it also po goes deep into into the actual interaction. Yeah, yeah. Until now, it's a big deal. Until now, it's quite complicated, right? You don't have video cameras in, and things in um, a normal interaction. But here, actually, at the beginning, all that data is there, and we're going to throw it away, which is not wrong, mm. not at all. But maybe some residual data, which was the identified and things, might be quite meaningfully collected in much the same way that Chris is a valuable resource. Yes, no, that's a really interesting idea. That would presumably require the consultation to be video rather than telephone uh, and why that, why 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 oh well you could do it over telephone if you did voice tele, surely by definition the tele interaction or is it just audio so um what i was going to say is that um it varies from service to service how um individual services have implemented telepsychiatry so some have focused almost entirely on telephone interaction and others have embraced video conferencing um, and obviously the data that you would get would vary and with telephone you would only be able to do presumably voice analysis um, but you're right i mean if you if as long as obviously there was agreement about recording and anonymizing of a video interaction you're absolutely right that that is a source of data for looking at it. And you could also combine that with your other measures such as monitoring mood or, you know, other measures that you could combine with it in a creative way. Hey, you are muted. I said there are several other connections, but I said it muted. Uh, with questions, um, Dutta is maybe the Dutta uh, Rina Dutta. Hello. Yes, actually, um, the answer to your question probably covers what I I was essentially. I'm a practicing clinician as well, and I was going to ask that question about um, whether much information is lost by um, sort of using an or just a tele telephonic um, review. Yeah. I personally found that telephonic review of patients that I know really well is can be actually um, less distracting not to have uh, a sort of face to face uh, actually but just, just actually focusing on the voice can be really helpful. However, when I'm doing a first assessment, I think the video consultation mm -hmm. is key. But I have found quite a lot of it's very, very different from an in person interaction, particularly when there's um, a uh, collaborator who's to be taken or you know, a partner wants to attend as well, which I've had because I see national patients. And it's really very, very difficult to, um, you know, to, to do that, I think, well. On So I've got a lot to learn. So thank you so much for pulling this evidence together, Catherine. It was an excellent talk. Really good. Yes, I think um, I, I think that's a common theme from clinicians I've talked to is that following up patients who you feel you know well it is um, is easier by telephone but as you say the initial consultation and it's one of the I suppose you know in an ideal world it would be nice to have guidance about the initial consultation and the follow-up because they are rather different yeah, they are uh, separate aren't they yeah they are and I think we're all learning and it's in a way it's good I think it is uh, it is a moment where we've been forced into a situation we wouldn't have chosen but we can take positive things from it and you know we will gain in our experience of using telephone and video consultation and as we go forward I think some patients will want to continue with that or combine it um, yeah and I think it can be extremely valuable like you say especially if we're adopting more um, online uh, questionnaires or apps or mm -hmm. um, other forms of sort of being able to show the patient quantitatively how things are varying over time, I think it could really help with the therapeutic process. So it's quite it's quite helpful that it's been that it's been uh, sort of put into practice quite quickly. We're able to see the benefits. Yes, and to question it. <laughs> yes, and there is um, some guidance which we've included on, for example, um, multidisciplinary reviews. 
okay. and how how to manage having several members of the team at one end and perhaps a patient and a carer and a support worker sitting at the other end and how oh, to right. manage that group interaction because it's not entirely obvious no, it's it's no. easy we're all familiar with doing it in person mm. but on on uh, a video call or a telephone call making sure obviously that everyone knows who's in the room but also making sure that everyone's included and has an equal voice it, it's quite a it's it is a certainly a learning process so there is some guidance on that and the child psychiatry guidance is also helpful slightly different but again that covers family assessments um, and also issues about assessing risk remotely, which which is, you know, more challenging. Thank you. That's really helpful. Bo? Bo, your hand is up. Yes, um, I want to ask about uh, telepsychiatry platforms and its security compliance. Uh, I have read NHS uh, Trust has banned the use of Zoom for uh, or tele psychiatry. I'm not sure if uh, if uh, Skype is, is banned or not. So I'm um, just wondering, um, does your guidance uh, include um, and, and you know um, uh, security compliance and the choices for for uh, tele psychiatry platforms? So that's a difficult question to answer succinctly, but I'll I'll give it a go. So there's national guidance. But um, as clinicians, we all have to work within our local trusts and each of our trusts are, are also have platforms that they will um, are recommending that we use. So in Oxford Health, um, I've been doing mainly telephone consultations, but the video platform, I think, is Teams for Oxford Health, but it varies in different uh, trusts. So I know that there are other trusts using different platforms. Um, but in terms of the guidance, there's national UK guidance, and then we have to go within our local um, information governance rules. Okay, and and the national one, the national UK uh, guidance, is it um, is it updated? Is it old or is it updated? So there was guidance towards the beginning of the um, pandemic. I'm not sure that that's from okay. NHSX. I'm not sure that that's been updated. Um, okay. Okay, it's, it's quite recent. Thank you. So Catherine's given a very stimulating talk. Does anybody else want to ask some questions? Anybody? Seems not. Um, thank you really very, very much, both of you, for two amazingly interesting and very different uh, presentations. Uh, both of which are very much at the heart of the sort of things we're interested in in this uh, small seminar. Uh, we're very, very grateful to you both for coming and giving your presentations, and thank you very much on behalf of our audience.